So, uh, Rav, I'll hand over to, uh, to you to introduce yourself. Well, thanks, for us. Thanks for everyone coming. My name is Rav Dalawal. I'm a venture capital investor and recovering CS executive. So. Hi, I'm Lindsay Zarafin. I lead customer success at sneak.io. Hi, my name is Caitlin Sullivan. I lead customer success at Vanta. Uh, and I'm Faraz, I'm the founder and CEO at Hook, and we're a machine learning platform that helps customer success teams predict their revenue um, accurately. My background before uh, starting Hook was I used to lead customer success at AppDynamics. We were a $4 billion acquisition by Cisco, and we grew to about 550 million ARR. And so in that journey, I kind of exp experienced the whole range of uh, the challenges at, at customer success. Um, so before we get started, I want to start with uh, this slide, which will talk to you about um, why does customer success matter at all? And uh, the graph that I'm showing you is the valuation of a company, sorry, the revenue of a company. And in this case, the company has not uh, done any sales at all except for year one when they had $10 million in ARR. And what's happening here is that the green line shows you what happens if they had 180% net retention. The middle line is at 140% net retention, and the bottom line is at 105% net retention. So as a company, if you have no new sales, starting with 10 million after five years, you have 100, 100 million in ARR, which makes you hugely attractive to uh, investors. And this is why the backdrop of this conference has all been about how net retention has become the most important metric that um, SaaS companies should be concerned about. This has been accelerated by the uh, changes in the market that we're all seeing, which is valuations are changing, companies are starting to churn more, and that in itself puts customer success right in the center and middle of SaaS. Um, in the last three years alone, I think we've seen customer success job rates grow by about 700%, which really shows you how, how this landscape's changing. Um, so with that, I'll start to direct towards the panelists. And um, Lindsay, I'll start with you first. What is uh, customer success and um, how's it involved? Sure, so I think 10 years ago, if you asked what customer success was, you know, you usually described it in relation to another function. Well, it's sort of like support, or it's sort of like account management, or it's sort of like professional services. Whereas now, you know, as a testament to the folks in this room, customer success is now an established function uh, at many, early, even early stage software companies. But I like to think of it as, as really, uh, customer success is whatever your business needs at that time to connect the edges of your product or your offering to the actual needs um, and value that your customer receives at the end. Rav, maybe you want to yeah, add to that? Absolutely, I, mean, I think that's a really great distillation. Um, I would probably layer onto that by saying it's really any function or any group that is creating the conditions for future revenue. And that's essentially going back to your graph there, Firaz. We're all trying to learn sales, go to market, close. And annual contract value, ACV, that builds our company, but it's actually net revenue retention that sustains it. Every successful software subscription company, from Zendesk to Salesforce, et cetera, by year five, six, seven, most of their new revenue is coming from the people they've already sold to. And that's why you need a function that helps drive fast value and creates the conditions for net revenue. Anything to add to that, Caitlin? No, I think um, you know when I started in customer success, it was always described as proactive customer support. And now it really is just a vital part of the, the revenue engine, especially at startups. Awesome. Um, I think a lot of the people here will be wondering when they get started out with customer success, or as they start to scale it, what should they be looking at in terms of hiring? Um, I talked about the idea that there's been such a growth in customer success hiring, and talent is difficult to find. Um, I know, Caitlin, you've got quite a strong opinion on it. Yeah. Um, so we'd love to hear what, um, what is it that uh, people should be looking for in their first customer success hires? Yeah, I think you, you definitely want somebody who's done the job before, ideally at a startup, because I think as a lot of us know, there's sort of a lot to, to weed through there. Um, what's most important to me, especially in those first couple of hires, are are you empathetic, which I think every CS professional has in common? Um, are you scrappy? Can you sort of weed through the muck of, of not having the resources at your fingertips, and, and are you accountable to your customers and, and your colleagues? Cool. Lindsay? 
Yeah, I think um, I get this question a lot. I think a lot of it depends on kind of what, again, that business needs at the time. But I think some good strategies for earlier stage. If, if you've got someone who's from your industry who knows the, the space and the practices and can help kind of connect your product to the customer's environment and their business, I think that can be really helpful. And then I think you really need to decide for your very first hire, do you need someone that's leaning more towards the technical side to get really into the weeds in the product? Or do you need someone that's more geared towards the relationship management side um, and focused on the business value and I think that first hire depends a little bit on where your business is at the time that you make that hire. I'll just add I think Caitlin your point about people who are consultative empathetic super important and again Lindsay to your point around some of those traits that you need I would just add to that I think as founders or, or, or people running this function there's five questions I think to ask yourself because it does vary a little bit by stage you know whether you're pre-product market fit go to market fit you know, how do we sell? Are we a freemium bottom-up model? Are we a top-down enterprise sale? How do we deploy? Is it highly technical? Do you need very specific product program management skills? Or is it pretty straightforward? Um, what's the change impact of our software? Does it change the way thousands of people work at our customer? Or is it like maybe 10 people in DevOps, right? How, um, how much industry or domain knowledge is required? Sometimes a CSM doesn't need any. They can learn it on the job. It'd be very hard to put uh, a non-data scientist person in front of a bunch of data scientists and show value. So think about that. And then how do you expand? What's the expansion motion? Is it more consumption, more license, complementary products? Because that will speak to how much commercial nous somebody would need. Awesome. I found um, when I was doing the, the hires back in my days at, at AppDynamics, and we rebuilt our customer success motion in the course of 12 months where we were at about 200 million ARR. Um, to become more proactive and what I found was that actually the experience in understanding your customers problem and their business Outweighed the need for them to have previous customer success experience and I think it's easy as, as SaaS founders as as, um, uh, as uh, SaaS employees to forget that but the reality is is that what your software is doing is solving a business problem and the technology is actually just a facilitator for for doing that so I would just add on, on, on that point actually for us it's a really important point if you're still searching for product market fit it's not a bad idea to have your a product person wear a customer success hat because that's the name of the game right if you've got product market fit at least in one or two segments and you're now scaling you know go-to-market organization you may want someone who's more client facing, a bit more commercially oriented, but also really understands the product. So again, that stage you're at really will depend on you know, that kind of profile. I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and this morning we were talking about how the roles change. And I know Lindsay, um, we started to talk around how you have um, renewals teams and support teams. I think um, many founders in, in here will be at the very first stage where the earliest hire is um, you know, someone that does everything. Certainly that is the case for us for, um, for Hook. Um, do you want to touch upon maybe some of the experience you've had and how that involves from earlier stages to later stages? Sure, absolutely. I mean, someone once told me a rule of three, which I think is kind of good, which is once you have like three people doing the same thing, they should be like a separate team. Yes. <laughs> um, but in the beginning, you really have those unicorns wearing lots of hats, right? So they're kind of jumping around and doing lots of different jobs. Um, and then obviously, once you get to five to 10 people, that, that starts to not scale, right? Because it's really hard to keep finding the unicorns that can do everything. So then you want to start to specialize. Um, and I think it makes sense to specialize along your customer journey, right? So someone focused more on the onboarding phase, someone maybe fo focused more on adoption, and then that renewal bit, which is a little bit more of a commercial focus, renewal expansion, again, depending on your commercial um, arrangement. Awesome. And Caitlin, your, your team started to kind of split, split up into specialty, specialities now. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about some of that, that structure and what you started to find? Yeah, we sort of kind of hit the same cliff where we were, we were wearing all the hats and um, at almost 3,000 or, or more than 3,000 customers, that's really hard to do. And so, um, you know, it's really sort of defining like what the most important pieces of your journey are. And then you can kind of specialize and segment from there. So for us, we knew that onboarding and adoption was really important. And so that's where we started. Awesome. Sounds good. I think that's, um, it's, it's really insightful to think about the rule of three as well, because I think it's easy to get stuck in getting external advice and not knowing whether it's relevant to your stage. Um, and certainly I've seen the evolution at the earlier stages where you have that one person that does everything. You begin to build a renewals team. You start to realize you've got services people that you need to bring in and, uh, and knowing when to scale those out is, um, uh, is important. I would just add, I think, 
thinking about what your sales team is going through is a really good indicator for you all as sort of founders. So if you're realizing, well, actually, my AEs now need support from SDRs or BDRs, they need solutions engineers, that's normally a sign you should start unbundling lots of other things from individuals to specialization. So that can be a useful way to kind of gut check, is it time to move to specialization? One other rule of thumb that's helpful is your, uh, when does your first cohort of customers come up for renewal? So if you're doing annual plans, right, and you're kind of looking ahead and you're seeing, okay, when is that first cohort of customers renewing? You want to make sure someone's thinking about that renewal and it's not a reactive, like, oops, we forgot those customers Or it's going to happen by magic. <laughs> yeah, or it's going to happen by magic without someone engaging. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting point. If you've got product market fit in a segment and then suddenly you start to sell into different segments, maybe even large enterprise segments, um, those kind of customers, you know, they don't stick to the script. They'll find ways to use your product that you hadn't thought about. And that often exposes a lot of gaps in your organization structure. That's also a good indicator you might need specialist technical teams, specialist renewals teams, etc. But also the thing to avoid there is to not unbundle and have what I like to call an everything department. So everything that doesn't fit, we'll just give that to the customer team. That is a rocky road to ruin for, for any business, I think. I, I, I want to cover um, a topic that we talked about at breakfast this morning on, on hiring as well. Um, you guys should have come to breakfast. It was a great, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it was a great breakfast. <laughs> on, the, um, uh, on, the, on the topic of hiring, uh, what, what are your thoughts about who they should report into? I know that's a... That's a an interesting debate, but um, should it be the CRO, um, the COO, sometimes the CMO? Well, again, I think it's very much about stage. You know, if you're in that pre-product market fit stage, you know, haven't probably reported into product because you're not going to become a company unless you can nail uh, the product market fit. I think when you are scaling, you've got product market fit, you're building your go-to-market organization, either in or very closely aligned to sales, wherever sales is reporting up into probably makes sense because if you think about it, CS is really part of an ongoing sales motion. You've landed the customer, but you want to sell more to them. So having them you know, both report up to CEO or CRO. It's also very useful for you as founders if your head of sales and head of CS report to you or to report to the same person because, as you know, sales never lose a deal because of sales. They lose it because the product doesn't do something. And CS never lose a customer because of CS. They lose it because the product didn't have X feature or whatever. And you need those independent data points to make up your own mind about where the actual problems lie. Uh, and then when you're a large complex business or a multi-product business, you need a whole customer organization, roll it up to a chief customer officer, I think. So we've, uh, we've defined what customer success is. We've hired our first people. We've started to get them to report into someone. Um, what is it that we should be looking at in terms of metrics and how to, uh, how to measure them, Rav? Oh, well, look, I mean, I think, first of all, it's important that the team is measured on something that's materially important to the company at the time. So. You know, in an early stage, you may be all about brand. We just got to build, build brand awareness, build brand awareness, align them to that. Is it MPS or is it something like that? But fundamentally, I think it boils down to two measures. One's leading, one's lagging, right? The lagging one is NRR. If we're investing in a team to help customers, we want to get that returned and we want to see some uplift. So 110, 120% NRR. That's lagging. So I think it's always, always really good for a CS team to have a quarterly measure. I like to call that a time to value measure. Is there some metric either in terms of product usage or product usage characteristics or adoption we need to get every customer to? Or is it just a case we just got to get every customer deployed within the quarter? Because if we don't deploy them, they don't see any value. So some NRR metric, North Star, time to value, I think the more leading metric. Caitlin, metrics? Yeah, I mean, I think net retention will always be top of mind, but it's important to really sort of define those milestones that lead up to the renewal and, and not to take your eyes off of really the health of your customers. And, and that'll look different at every company. And it's important to reassess as your business grows and matures, your customer segments start to change to, to sort of come back to that and redefine it. Yeah, I totally agree with what everyone else said on those are the key metrics. I also think something to think, think about is what do you measure versus what do you comp on? So I think some people rush to put like a very complicated comp plan in place um, without actually proving the ability to, to measure repeat, like consistently some of these metrics. So my advice would be um, before you set anyone up with a comp plan, make sure you've actually um, measured that metric as a KPI for at least one quarter and that you have some confirmation that it's, it's actually uh, directionally indicative of performance before you tie comp to it or you'll spend 
all your time managing a comp plan instead of actually moving the business you forward. You clearly lived through that pain. <laughs> well, probably yeah, 10 yeah, times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and actually, a really interesting point that often gets overlooked is a really good way to align people in the go-to-market organization is to give them some overlapping comp. So, you know, if your CSM team is predominantly comped on NRR, make 5% of the salesperson's comp NRR. Make 5% of the CS person's comp helping them close the deal. This is where a lot of scaling problems occur because people are just compensated to not think about the person who's coming next. So I think this sort of, some of the more customer focused metrics can be really important to have everybody have a portion of across the organization, I think. Mm. I, I found that the, one of the most effective things we did at App Dynamics was uh, to give the CS team a number that nobody else owned. And what we'd found was that um, there was a direct correlation between adoption and whether or not someone would renew. So we found that uh, a renewing customer would be at, say, 57%, and churn customer would be at 29% adoption. And interestingly, when we gave the customer success team the adoption metric, they gained so much respect within the company because they now owned a metric that, that wasn't stolen by sales and, uh, and it, wasn't, it was only influenced by them. Um, uh, I'd be interested to hear, hear your thoughts around um, you know, that kind of approach. I've paid on adoption before as well. I think the, cha like the challenge is just the accuracy of your ability to measure it and the systems you have in place for, for controls, right? Because there's weird gotchas where, well, if a customer churns, all of a sudden the adoption goes up because they fell out of the denominator or, you know, this, this customer is using the product in a different way, so they're actually getting a ton of value, but uh, the, the utilization isn't showing it. So that's why I would say, if you can measure it for a quarter first mm. and you like it, yeah. then pay on it. And there's seasonality to that. that yep. you know, in Scandinavia, everyone goes on holiday for three months because it's the only good weather, and if you're measuring <laughs> the team on adoption, you're not making any money that quarter, yeah. right? So I think adoption, I feel it's, it's a proxy for some characteristic of product usage. Right. So it might not be physical number of users, it might be data throughput through the system, or they're using six out of the top ten key features or something like that, right? Something that correlates to what you believe is business value. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a strong opinion on um, how we should measure sentiment versus engagement and behavior. Should probably think about running a company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, how should people use sentiment? Like, what, what is it around sentiment metrics that people should take in? Yeah, I've become less and less of a fan of sentiment measures over the years because there are so many nuances, right? If you think about how someone views your company or your brand, it's not just the person they talk to the most, it's the sum of every experience they have with the brand, from buying it, to deploying it, to going to your website, to raising a ticket. Why put one person on the hook for the rest of the brand, right? So that's why I'm not necessarily, I think sentiment may have a part because you want to track qualitative and quantitative metrics. Sometimes people don't use your product very well, but they love you. Mm. That still is a renewal risk. And conversely, they do not talk to you. They do not engage with you. Their NPS is low, but they've got strong product usage. So I kind of think of it as like a blood pressure reading. You need both values, but I wouldn't comp people on the sentiment values. There's just too many other variables. I mean, if your patch was you know, DAC, you're never going to hit your NPS number. Culturally, they give nobody a 10, right? So it's not fair. Yeah. Any other thoughts around sentiment and PS? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely a blended metric that should go into sort of some sort of overall way to measure health. Um, we've all gone into a renewal call where you're looking at their usage and like, yes, like they use it yeah. all the time and they're super upset, right? And so you can't just rely on on usage. Um, something that we do is just when a CSM gets off the call with the customer, we just have them update their sentiment sort of regularly, and then we use that as a factor that goes into the overall health score. Um, but it can be really hard to nail. I think yeah. a lot of folks have, have gotten burned with just looking at sentiment. I'll give you a funny story. When I was at Slack, some one gave us a zero on MPS. And you know, I had to call them, right, and find out why we got the zero. And he went, oh, no, no, we love you guys, right? We're just running our MPS, and we wanted to see what your process was if we gave you a zero, yeah. right? And it's like, thank you. Stats yeah. completely screwed up, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is why it's not really particularly useful. Are you sure they just weren't expecting to get uh, somebody, <laughs> somebody once did it on the mobile app, and they thought it was a 10, and they right. didn't render properly, and they gave yeah. us a zero, right? People so, want the pop-up to go they, away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They want the, yeah, exa exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they want the pop-up to go away, yeah. Cool, so we've, uh, we've built customer success, we've hired some people, we've started to measure them and give them some metrics. Um, there's a, an amazing buzzword in, uh, in customer success today around digital customer success scale. 
Um, I think it's becoming increasingly important. Lindsay, I know your team's been doing some, um, some awesome work in it. Uh, would love you to talk about what is digital CS? When does it matter? Yeah, definitely. I think it's important. So, you know, we built a digital success function. Uh, you know, it started with the small customers, right, as a way to serve them. And then we actually realized that all customers want to be served digitally. In this day and age, you probably experience it yourself. You don't want to have to get on the phone with someone unless you have to. If you can get an answer um, and, and watch a quick video or, or read an article that's going to tell you exactly what you need to do in the product, then you can save your in-person time with your, your CSM talking about the value, talking about your, your strategies and your best practices. So uh, I think that's one of the, my biggest lessons learned with digital success is it's not just for the small customers. It's, it's really helps you scale everything you do. Uh, Caitlin, would love to hear your thoughts on it as well. I know we were talking about community. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, that's a hot topic as part of that as well. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's about sort of to your point, meeting your customers where they are. And, um, you know, at Vanta, we just had this incredible growth. We couldn't hire fast enough. and. Then we hired a CFO, so we got budgets in place. But um, uh, you know, our customers don't want to be bottlenecked at that level, and I think that you know, really defining what should be human-led or a tech touch, and then building kind of communities around that can really help. And community can be a really great way to get product feedback, to sort of lessen the burden on CS and support teams as well. And so that's been really helpful too. I think about digital CS in the same way as customer marketing. Really, you know, if you want to get messaging across about product or value to hundreds of thousands of potential customers or existing customers, you're going to have to use the customer marketing style tools and techniques. And so I don't think it's any surprise that there's more and more startups out there building this kind of tooling uh, to support people who have got you know, thousands, hundreds, thousands of customers. Are there interesting approaches, um, Lindsay, that maybe your team's been using on the digital CS side to help scale that? I know. We've talked before about um, pooled CS models, for example, to drive that. Yeah, so I, I, what, what Raj said, I think ours is, our digital CS is really a, it, it's a joint venture between customer success and marketing. So trying to leverage the marketing stack uh, in terms of email, email outreach, webinars, right, group sessions, which have been very effective. And then we have like a, a Slack channel, kind of like a, a one-to-many community Slack channel that allows you to answer questions um, in a way that, that serves all customers instead of wasting time on those one-to-one. So which is kind of taking that one-to-many approach first and foremost, um, and then choosing who to engage with. So we have just a couple of digital CSMs or community CSMs, and they're, they're not assigned to any accounts specifically, but they have, they're, they're leveraging data, and they're choosing who to engage with. So if a customer you know, is not moving forward through your journey according to how you want them to, so if they've hit 60, 90 days and they haven't logged in, then we're intervening intervening, but we're letting the tech go first. And so you're choosing to engage as opposed to like the traditional model where some of those small customers are the noisiest customers. It can end up taking up all of your time um, and you're not in control of, of where you engage. And statistically, they churn at higher rates too, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, because you can't get to them. Yeah. Makes sense. So let's uh, focus on the most important topic for today, which is um, uh, what is the actionable thing that people can do when they, uh, when they walk out of here? Uh, Caitlin, let's uh, let's start with you. What's the uh, what's the tangible takeaway that, yeah. that people should start with? I mean, I think it's always important to remember that the success of your customers does not just live in a, in a CSM's backyard. Um, you know, Advanta, something that really helped us was having sort of top line company goals around the customer outcomes that we were looking to achieve. Um, to to hold everybody accountable and really to benefit our customers. Um, A tactical advice I would say would be get your product team in front of customers early and often and hire your first CSM probably a little bit earlier than than maybe you think. (laughs) Give them time to really dig into the product and and get to know your customers. It's funny, the CSM thing, uh, when I first started out in CS, Series C, Series D would when you start would start to yeah. build out your CST. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and these days the um, I mean you can't raise a Series A without having a CS team yeah. and a CS plan in place. And I'm guessing at that stage it was all about revenue protection, right? Stop churn, stop churn, mm-hmm. as opposed to grow, 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 right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And almost you you also at that stage had to start to separate out how do you how do you control the costs of like how you keep your customers protected? So you labeled it customer success, it yep. might have been done by sales or other people before. Um, and actually today I, I speak to a lot of founders who um, hire their customer success person before even their first revenue paying customer. I know at least for us that was the case. Mm. Makes a ton of sense. 
Uh, Lindsay, what's your, uh, your actionable takeaway? Yeah, I think um, everyone in the company has a, a role to play with customers. So really similar to what Caitlin said, as a CS team, like your job is to put the customer in front of other parts of your business. And if you have a, a product leader or a CEO or anyone who says, well, I don't need to talk to the customer to do my job, well, that's, that's wrong, right? Because <laughs> if, if you're not talking to your customers, you're not going to get the right feedback on, um, on what's working and what isn't working with your product. I think the other action advice I would say, depending on where you are, if you haven't formally mapped your customer journey, um, it, you know it's it's really important to do that early. And the customer journey, not from your outside perspective, not from the sales perspective or the buying journey, but the actual customer journey. Like for as you were talking about earlier, what is the customer's business problem and how are they trying to solve it? And whenever I do customer journey mapping with earlier stage companies, I tell them you're not allowed to talk about your product at all. Mm -hmm. this, this, this is the customer's journey and what business problem are they solving? And I think if you go through that exercise exercise, it'll be very enlightening um, into how you need to incorporate your product into their process. So I would say if you're building a team or you have a team, I think number one is make sure they are measured on something that's materially important to you as a company that you're targeting on that. And then have a very crisp one, two sentence max definition of the value they add to customers and the value they add to your bottom line. And I think for those of you who are founders in the room, I would say the actionable thing is go away and memorize the phrase, there's no such thing as post sales. My takeaway is um, I think people overcomplicate the data problem. And uh, when I first started to figure out how to become data driven in CS, we actually just got a spreadsheet of all of our uh, renewals and churns. We made uh, two columns. One column had adoption. The other column had another usage metric. And all we did was we just graphed that in Excel. So we didn't spend um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on data scientists at that point. We didn't have to go and wait for our product team. And it really started to give us like immediate insights into what is the data point that was there, which showed us that adoption had this, this very high correlation. And that allowed us to start to set things with the team. So, um, you know, I, if you could do one thing on the data side, I would just do that.